Good morning. Uh, great pleasure to be here and, um, and actually quite intimidating because uh, the reality is that uh, I am and my generation is constantly always on the verge of obsolescence as new technologies come on board. Uh, we keep extending our education as students. But as students who are deeply uh, committed to practice, uh, we're also constantly coming into confrontation with the challenge that we're always operating outside of the law because everything within the legal system, at least of the United States, uh, goes against the possibility of innovation or invention at any level. Even in the context of the AIA contract, the idea that an architect would have control over her or his means and methods of construction is something that is uh, somehow been divorced from us. So much of the research that we've done uh, over the last 25, 30 years has been dedicated to uh, essentially tying a bow around that loophole and establishing some relationship with the advent of representation such that uh, it establishes a direct connection with the possibility of construction. Of course, historically, we're all aware about the instrumentality about, of how we draw and how we uh, project life as it is out there in relationship to representation. Uh, mimesis is one way of doing it. Uh, the prospect of geometry or descriptive geometry, another. Uh, the modeling through Rhino, uh, another, and with the advent of computation or scripting, yet code is yet another way in which we begin to reimagine uh, what our thumbprint is uh, on this world. And yet in this last chapter, something pretty radical is happening. If representation uh, were to be a kind of fingerprint uh, of previous generations, code is the first time where that fingerprint is no longer uh, a visual fing fingerprint. It is code. It is a script. It is abstract. And therefore, it, it produces non-visual means by which we're constantly operating. So take, for example, the idea of identifying certain nodes uh, and understanding that those nodes don't have a particular dimension, but have variable dimensions on the x and y axes, and how an abstract pattern like that is really the basis of what uh, in brick technology we call uh, the Flemish bond, as it may turn out. Noting that the Flemish bond has the ability to fold on a diagonal crease is something that we established in our minds many, many years ago on distinguishing between the common bond and the Flemish bond when we looked at the work of Leverance many, many years ago. Putting these uh, into the script meant we could begin to imagine uh, ways of giving a wall uh, lateral strength while giving it air and light uh, through uh, code. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that the script I just ran for you was only done about five years ago. Uh, this model was built over 20 years ago uh, and, of course, done through non-digital means. Uh, and this was done five years after that as we came into the computer learning how to draw this. So this entire presentation, in, in effect, is in reverse. Uh, with every new means, the instrumentality of ideas is ne not necessarily in sync with the technologies at hand. And yet we all know that certain instrumentalities change the way that we think uh, about things. Uh, as a reminder, this is the sketch that we did when we were on site in 1993, I think it was, 
when we were visiting the site. Uh, this uh, possibility uh, took us to the idea of means and methods. Uh, as it turns out, the clients of that house in Caracas could not get along. Their divorce led to uh, extending our research through a pavilion within the context of a restaurant whose entire budget was a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, but when we presented this pavilion to the contractor, it came back at $200,000, leaving us with about $50,000 left for the rest of the restaurant, making it impossible for us to build it. So we said to ourselves, what would it take if we built it, if we owned the means and methods? Uh, and by establishing a relationship with construction, we essentially printed out the drawings at full scale on the ceiling. And by doing that, by hanging a plumb bob, we realized that we could build seven layers per day. And by building seven layers a day, uh, essentially make that structure for $30,000 rather than $200,000. Now, this may seem obvious to most of you because uh, current culture, uh, which is DIY, uh, produces and conceptualizes the work of construction in a much more seamless way than we did 25 years ago. I could tell you stories about how I walked 10 miles to go to school, but, but you know the story. Technology is advancing at such a rapid pace that um, in many ways those early years for us were driven by a series of installations uh, because that is what we could afford to do on our academic budgets while in fact we were committed to a broader relationship with practice at large. And so some of this presentation is in order, others are not. I'm going to go back and forth in time to establish the long durée in which research happens and, and through what means it happens. In this project for fabrications in New York, we discovered through the McDonald's uh, boxes the kind of scored seam uh, through which we uh, established what we call the stitch seam, um, which is essentially the scoring of steel to produce continuity in the bend and, and the prospect of working drawings that no longer require a commitment to the plan and the section but a flattening of drawings, which by now is standard, to make non-standard pieces of over, over 50 different types of panels. And what's important in this one is not that it's non-standard, but the fact that all of this is a, a mechanism by which you escape the tyranny of uh, the extruded sections of I-beams, angles, and channels but also are able to bring everything, every single panel, within the idea of correct and right construction, meaning everything is plumb, everything is absolutely level, and effectively what we achieve through digital manufacturing is the idea of zero tolerance. From the perspective of arrival, everything is a flat canvas, a square, almost as if it was a Mondrian. Many years later, of course, in renovating the BP gas station, uh, we inherited not so much a desire to, uh, of the will to form something spectacular, but really renovating something that uh, had eccentric structural loads and eccentric programmatic uh, uh, loads on the other hand. And so we realized quickly that we didn't need uh, uh, a solution. What we needed was a system. And if that system were parametrically uh, malleable enough, it could produce, through essentially the hexagon, the ability to break down through a crystallization of a geometry that could uh, expand, contract, and flatten in relationship to the very programs it was submitted to. And as such, uh, 
by understanding the breakdown of that geometry, its incorporation of lighting, uh, fire suppression systems, we could also identify moments where structure was needed, where the pay booth was needed, and of course where the signage was needed. This understanding also comes with our commitment not only to geometric predispositions, but material behavior. Um, knowing that the grain of wood is malleable on one axis, but not on the other axis, uh, gave us recourse to come to understanding of other disciplines, like for instance, uh, tailoring and suturing uh, and the sartorial trade, uh, not only through the mechanism of pleating, but in this case of the dart. The dart, as you all know, is the prospect by which a flat sheet surface is excavated and by bringing it together produces a conical surface, a very a kind of low-tech uh, compound surface. And by doing that, it produces the possibility of working with and against the grain of wood uh, to produce a uh, complex geometry, if you wish. This research, of course, prompted us to think somehow differently about, in architectural terms, the relationship between form and content. In other words, what is this skin uh, suggesting is inhabited inside of it? What is its performativity? What does it contain? And the ambiguities that architecture involves. Knowing fully well that uh, only 1% of architecture really has the luxury of dealing with uh, the ceiling as a, an inhabitable surface. We're constantly confronted with those projects that need to deal with the junk that is up there, the mechanical systems uh, in the air, which are constantly uh, suppressed with hung ceiling systems, and then the ground systems, which have all of the technology of the wiring and so forth. And so working with some of that research uh, to absorb some of the technocratic and bureaucratic manifestations uh, of architectural imperatives, uh, we have been dealing with a, a, a family of projects that are built conceptually upside down. Uh, the structural systems, the mechanical systems, even programmatic systems, suspended from the air uh, as a way of maintaining the ground intact, uh, programming everything we can in the ceiling uh, as a way of dropping it to the ground to maintain the, uh, the ever-presence uh, of that ground as a flexible and malleable condition. This theme of building upside down has in a strange way come to represent for us in architectural terms the possibility of the dome. Uh, and in fact, uh, in collaboration with John Wardle Architects, we've had the occasion to build two projects in Melbourne which deal with this prospect in completely different ways. The second one of them is looking at the technologies of rebar and the bending of that rebar and understanding what it would mean if the new bridge that connects the, the park next to the Yarra River to the tennis open fields, and how through one element we could uh, take the idea of bending to begin to merge structure and skin into one uh, common property to develop a strategy for the belly of this bridge, which is part of the landscape and the way you see the bridge for the majority of the time, the railing, and of course, ultimately the lighting and all of the other infrastructure that goes above it. And of course, looking at the maximum moment uh, of these bridges and developing a structural diagram in relationship to the rebar, dis diffusing and dispersing those forces across the rebar uh, gave occasion for uh, creating a hybrid structure that uh, works with tensile and compressive forces to give a common syntax to what is otherwise compartmentalized through different technologies. This uh, commitment to uh, structural thinking 
happens also to uh, disperse itself across three schools of architecture that we had the occasion of winning, one in Georgia Tech, one in Melbourne in the center, and one in Canada. And I'll try to present these projects to you uh, with uh, some haste. In the context of Melbourne, uh, with a site plan directly in the middle of campus, working with the Neo-Georgian courtyards uh, of a beautiful campus, we had the occasion of giving space to a matte building uh, that occurs on the center of campus. With a promise of a new studio space, uh, we came to realize that the budget of the school can afford everything but the studio space itself. That means that all of the students could only work on what's called hot desks and not dedicated studio spaces. So this atrium became the new uh, design studio with a site plan that is very much committed to the idea of the campus working in the round, the building was urbanized from all directions, essentially making it the design hub of not just the School of Architecture, but of the entire campus. But the studio that was set to be on top of the building as a kind of mat organization was basically value engineered out of the budget. And by doing that, we had to carve out of the net to gross area some idea about a studio that would become an extension of the corridors on either side and then steal spaces from either side as we begin to conceptualize uh, the studio throughout the morning hours, afternoon hours, and evening hours. And as such, what are traditionally just corridor and circulation spaces become model making desks on one level, drafting desks at another level, and studio desks at another level. Here on the second floor with the model making, conference areas, the drafting, and the crit areas, and a technology that brings them all together uh, where the formwork becomes part of the natural resource that remains within the building itself. Screwing in steel within cross-laminated timber, uh, pouring it with concrete. The, the crust of this project is prefabricated basically off-site and embedded within the logic of this building. Now having everything in, dy in dynamic flow and constantly changing, one element within this building stays the same, and that is the dedicated design studio, which is part and parcel of the structural idea of the building. And this is where I go back to the idea of the structure being suspended uh, top down. Working very much urbanistically like some of the classical antecedents uh, that are on the screen, instead of objectifying that, that um, studio, uh, we came across a text that uh, Wardle reminded me of, of D.H. Lawrence uh, down under, basically arguing with his wife for six months before they escaped, and wondered what it would mean to take a structural system, essentially a two-way slab, fabricated off-site, spanning 22 meters in one direction, with coffering that gives it lateral stability, and then working with massive timber, <coughs> suspending that structure upside down, and thinning it out as it comes down as a natural extension of the X and Y axes. Now, interestingly enough, as we conceptualize the prospect of this structure, uh, we also had to calculate its loads such that they diminished as they come down, essentially going from massive uh, LVL uh, members that you could occupy, they're about nine feet tall, to very thin membranes as they cascade down. At the top, massive, and in a way classically reversed, you're inhabiting the beam itself, and as you go to the bottom, you begin to reveal the crust 
uh, as it incrementally changes to become the thin veneer of plywood that uh, materializes the uh, acoustic uh, ceiling uh, in the space below. As I said, this building was built uh, about 80% off-site with many of its elements being uh, delivered to the site at 3, 4, 5 in the morning. Uh, the entire roof was erected in less than two weeks with a kind of uh, impressive and robust uh, and muscular studio that is suspended. Ironically, the steel in there is a kind of belt and suspender strategy. If there's a fire, uh, everything will burn down, but the steel will still keep it up. I'll skip this animation, but suffice it to say that uh, our research has sort of expanded also into the environmental realm because as you begin to uh, justify and give multiple narratives to what you're working on, uh, how it works with the broader ecology of the building is central to its argument. Um, I was reminded last night uh, by, by Min that he was at Georgia Tech and I couldn't um, uh, forget some of the critical research I did down there uh, with some key people. One of them being Brandon Clifford who was a student then and now a professor at MIT. And what I posed to the students then was why is it that we commonly think of vector active systems, form active systems, and surface active systems, but we don't think of them as seamless and working in tandem with each other? Why is it that we think of water, we think of snow, we think of ice or steam as a natural extension of a change of state, but in structural terms we're unable to do that? And so we set our eyes on a research to develop structural systems that would seamlessly transform from one state to the other in the context of a molecular system, if you like, a new brick that could be manipulated on the X, Y, and Z axis to go from a kind of box beam condition to on one axis to a kind of uh, vector active on the other. And recognizing that these could uh, develop two-prong systems that go into four and four-prong systems that go into eight, we could develop an entire installation that was essentially based on the logic of stacking at one end, uh, a laterally braced wall in the center, a truss that spans in the center, and a cantilever on the opposing end. The change of state, as it was called, really materialize these on a base system of 24, which naturally divides by 4 or 6, 3 and 2. And what seems, let's say, poetically ephemeral is in fact a, a mathematical breakdown of a numerical system that twists along the length of this installation. And strangely, and even though empirically developed, the slump of this truss was no more than an, an inch and a half based on a bay that's about uh, 40 feet long. This uh, structural research extends itself through the Toronto project, which is uh, now almost complete, finding itself uh, at the center of Spadina Circle as an extension of the Knox College. It is one of those curious opportunities where you get to build on a monumental site with the responsibility of developing a base that maintains the stature of the heritage to the south, extending the landscape out in future additions, uh, and excavating urban spaces around it as part of its commitment uh, to the extension uh, of the school uh, of architecture. The site works symbolically on the north-south axis, but practically speaking, you enter the building on the east-west axis. And so while the image of the building is to give a new northern elevation as a counterpoint 
to the historic south, uh, the reality is that the front doors of these buildings are by an arcade on one side and a plaza on the opposite side, activating an internal street. This internal street essentially gives way to multiple programs and experiences connecting to the studio spaces. And as a piece of landscape, the ground, the second floor, the third floor, and the roof are conceptually landscape pieces that try to bring the light into the core of the building. And so while a very economical structural system goes up from the ground to support the second floor, we needed a long span structure to span over 110 feet between the two cores, working a little bit like the first and fourth bridge, but not through uh, vector active systems, rather a surface system that would gain its structural currency by the way in which it folds. Of course, uh, like all projects, we researched many ways in which that may happen. But looking at the advent of daylighting uh, and the hydrology of the site, we realized that the structural uh, commitments had to come in tandem with that. What would it mean to span all of that if the drainage came inside and produced columns? It doesn't make sense. And so we developed a scissor system for this Firth, Firth and Forth uh, bridge so that it would come down on either side while bringing natural light on the edges towards from the north while bringing direct uh, uh, southern light to the center. Now, I don't know if you f feel the same pressures here in France or whether you go through the same problems, but effectively at a critical moment during this project, the contractor said that this is not buildable, not affordable, and that the architects have not resolved the geometry. And this is while I was on a flight to Melbourne to, to, to go to a site visit. And so we realized that the project is effectively dead. So we said, OK, why don't we build the mock-up within the context of the studio, if only to present to them the notion that this concrete shell has precedence, but the precedence is also something that is achievable, because these are all conceived of in terms of developable surfaces. We built it in the context of our studio of just studs. Uh, we laid out one stud at a time and demonstrated that this can be built out of sheet material. And most importantly, we also discovered that there is a radiant panel system that can be put into there. So that is while the heating is embedded in the ground, the cooling is, is embedded in the, in the roof. So all of a sudden, these multiple alibis produce the possibility of a real project. And so we saved about $700,000 within this one week exercise. The challenge, of course, was that they were not willing to do it in concrete uh, because steel was more economical. And for us to figure out how is it to break down that same geometry within a completely new system. And so going through the exercises of the steel system, uh, breaking it down uh, through incremental geometries rather than a seamless one, and then breaking down that surface, the project is uh, somehow coming to fruition um, through a completely different means. Construction is messy. Practice is even messier. The pure narratives uh, of the academic context keep getting revised by in situ circumstances, by the political uh, instruments uh, of the university. And so even diagrams like this, which are intended to embed a project within the larger ecological pro uh, context uh, of a project, uh, are by now obsolete. All of them are surpassed by new systems, and yet somehow uh, we need to keep up with the circumstances of a project, if only with the possibility of, uh, of building them. Working at the urban scale on the one hand to establish that the building is part of a larger uh, uh, ecology of the city, but also understanding that within the microsection 
of these walls and within their structural systems. Uh, every aspect of these projects uh, is there to uphold some kind of narrative uh, that has the ability to, to pass one test uh, or the other. So integrating these buildings has uh, come to represent a key part of this. And then somehow, after you put all of this together, uh, there is what? All of this is somehow invisible to the eye. And so the facade that holds the image of that building is somehow a kind of index of how that building is working. In this case, that complex roof system all crystallizing itself on this one gutter system that comes to irrigate uh, the entire landscape uh, that forms the basis uh, 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 of this building. That, in fact, is what uh, is happening currently. And the way in which we translated the Gothic silhouette of the existing building within the new without making direct iconographic um, uh, registers uh, across the elevations of the building. We still struggle and uh, we fail actually. Uh, we Photoshop sometimes and other times we, uh, uh, we deal with the unpleasantness of construction. But uh, this is the current state of that building as it struggles and hobbles uh, to the completing line. Uh, but also a testament to our commitment to try in some way or the other to make that transition from the increment of a unit that we work on in the context of the academic realm uh, to the scale of an urban building with multiple constituencies and uh, a myriad uh, of responsibilities. Thank you very much.